Okay, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Ross Miller, and I'm a software developer for Oak Ridge National Laboratory, and I'm here to talk about some of our first impressions with the Fujitsu A64FX processors that we recently installed in our uh, Wombat cluster here at ORNL. So, to start with, uh, Wombat is a small research cluster uh, based on the AR64 architecture. It started out as a uh, part of H HPE's Project Comanche uh, that eventually led to the Apollo 70 product line. Uh, it's based on uh, Marvell Thunder X2 processors. Uh, currently, we have eight Thunder X2 nodes. Each node is a dual socket, 64 cores total. Uh, 256 gigabytes of RAM, EDR and Finiband, and uh, onboard SATA SSDs for node local storage. Shortly before SC19, uh, we went and upgraded these nodes, four of these nodes, with NVIDIA Volta GPUs. We put uh, two GPUs per node into four of these nodes, and that was uh, basically a mad scramble to get those up and running and uh, have CUDA installed in time for people to actually try it out and uh, have some numbers to report at SC last year. Uh, additionally, besides the compute nodes, we do have two login nodes that are based on Thunder X2s and also our management servers are actually x86-64. Uh, now, most recently, in what seems to be something of a tradition, uh, right before SC, we went and upgraded the hardware again. Uh, this time around, we added 16 nodes of Apollo 80 uh, these nodes each have a single A64FX processor in them. And what is very interesting, as everybody all excited, of course, is that uh, these processors uh, do, in fact, implement the SVE instruction set. Uh, there's 48 cores per processor, and addition, additionally, there's 32 gigabytes of HBM2 memory on the CPU package. Uh, according to, to Fujitsu, this uh, processor is capable of a, a terabyte per second of main memory bandwidth and uh, 2.7 teraflops dub double precision floating point. Uh, besides the processors, the nodes also have uh, EDR InfiniBand and uh, onboard NVMe devices. Uh, and in particular, we actually configured uh, the NVMe, some of the NVMe as swap space to compensate for the limited amount of system memory. And I will talk about that uh, shortly. Uh, as far as administering the cluster goes, there's a couple of challenges here. Some of them are obvious and some of them a little less so. Uh, on, on the more obvious side of things, uh, this is a heterogeneous node architecture. We've basically got three different types of compute nodes, uh, the Thunder X2s by themselves, Thunder X2 plus GPU, and now the A64FX nodes. Uh, furthermore, the A64FX nodes really have, are very, have a very small amount of system memory on them. That 32 gigs of HBM is all that there is. These nodes don't have any additional DDR memory anywhere. Uh, on the somewhat less obvious side of things, uh, we also had a, a rather limited amount of administrator resources. Uh, right now, it's just me and one other fella helping me out, and neither of us are full time on this. Uh, we all we both have other duties to attend to. Uh, furthermore, we were under some pretty significant time pressure to try and get these A64FX nodes online uh, in time for SC20 this year. Um, you know, because of that, we had to make some decisions that prioritized uh, ease of administration over absolute performance. Um, so, you know, among other things, despite the fact that it's, you know, very different types of compute nodes, we did end up deciding to use a single image, single boot image for all of the compute nodes and the login nodes. Uh, and that means that this image has uh, the CUDA libraries installed, it has the compilers installed. Um, and that just makes it rather big and bulky. Uh, furthermore, these node images are loaded into tempfs uh, partitions, i.e. RAM disks. Uh, and that further cuts into, or significantly cuts into, the amount of uh, memory available on the uh, A64FX nodes. Uh, now, as I alluded to before, we are able to mitigate that somewhat 
by using swap space, the uh, the tempf tempfs uh, file systems really are designed to actually be swapped out, and that works quite well. Um, since the since the tempfs uh, images, the boot images are uh, mostly read only. Once things do get swapped out, they don't have to be ever written to disk a second time. If they get brought back in for some reason into main memory, uh, swapping them out again does not really cost any time. So this whole idea of swap in an HPC environment, I thought was something that we should really bring up and 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 talk about. Um, you, know, you almost never hear about swap on HPC resources and you know for good reason. Um, however, the Apollo 80 architecture is kind of atypical and as was our choice to prioritize uh, convenience over performance. Uh, in our case, swap seemed to be a fairly elegant and inexpensive solution. Um, it basically allows all 32 gigs of RAM you know, minus the kernel uh, to be available to users' codes when the codes are running. You know, the the boot images, although they're needed for certain things, they don't actually need to be in RAM all the time. Uh, now, even though you, we do have swap, you still have to be careful about your problem size and making sure your problem will fit in memory. Uh, you know, in the in the standard in the standard. Uh, clusters where there isn't swap, you know, if you problem exceeds the problem size of the RAM, uh, if your problem size exceeds the available memory on the node, then your program crashes and it's pretty obvious what happened. When you've got swap enabled like we do, if your problem size exceeds the, the memory, uh, available memory of the node, your program just runs slowly. It doesn't crash and now it's not really clear why your program is running so slowly. So that is something that uh, we do have to be careful with now. Um, but having said that, this is I've been thinking about this now a little bit, and I'm beginning to wonder if maybe swap will start to make a comeback in HPC environments. Um, now, clearly, our use case on Wombat is something of a niche use case, but if we start seeing more cases where the uh, memory is directly on the CPU package and can't be upgraded. And in particular, if the uh, uh, you know memory to core ratio continues to decrease, like it has with the Apollo 80s, where there's you know less than one gig of RAM per core now, uh, I'm wondering if uh, swap might start showing back up, you know, uh, in more use cases. Anyway. It's something to think about and something I've, I'm kind of interested to see what happens in the future. Okay, on to some very preliminary performance numbers. Uh, so just as a reminder, these, these new A64FX nodes have only been online for about a month uh, at the time of me making this recording. So we haven't had a lot of time to really optimize anything. Um, I did try to make some initial runs with HPL and HPCG. I am not well versed in the arcane art of tuning these benchmarks and uh, the results show it. Uh, specifically, I was able to get maybe 20 to 25% of the performance that I probably should be able to get. That is, you know, I ran some single node tests and compared that with what was reported on the top 500 list by the Fugaku engineers, uh, and like I said, 20 to 25 percent of what the uh, hardware should be capable of. Uh, I am 99 percent certain that that is more a case of just tuning the the benchmark runs rather than any sort of uh, problem with the uh, you know problem with our hardware or anything like that. Uh, on more happier news. Uh, we were able to run the stream triad benchmark and get some pretty good results there. Uh, big thanks to Eric Nielsen at NASA and Mohammed Zubair at Old Dominion University uh, for running this benchmark. Um, what seems to be interesting about this, that I, or at least that I find interesting, is that the benchmark does still seem to be highly compiler dependent. They, uh, the 816 gigabyte per second number 
was achieved using a build of GCC from the master uh, Git repo, the master branch of the Git repo. When we tried to build it with GCC 10.2, which is the latest that's actually been released, uh, they only achieved 622 gigabytes per second. And finally, I don't know what uh, order these videos are going to be presented in, uh, but pay close attention to what John Stone is going to be presenting about NAMD and VMD. Uh, he had some has some very interesting things to say about porting those codes over to SVE and what his experiences were on Wombat. So, uh, assuming it hasn't been presented yet, that will be a very good presentation to watch. Uh, conclusions and closing remarks. When we first thought about getting these nodes, my my oh my first uh, thought was you know I very much wanted to try out the SVE instruction set. Uh, however, after having these nodes for a little while and and uh, doing some experimentation with them, it seems like actually the the memory bandwidth from the HBM may be the most useful thing, not the SVE. Uh, in any case, they're both very interesting uh, architecture choices that um, you know, I'm going to be uh, very interested in see, seeing how applications can take advantage of those in the future. Uh, the second point I wanted to make is it does seem to be that the compilers are still improving in their support for SVE. Um, like I said, with the stream benchmark, uh, we had to run an unreleased version of GCC to get the highest performance. Um, on a related note, I've heard some very interesting things about Fujitsu's compiler for the A64FX, and I'd really like to try it out. So if anybody from Fujitsu is uh, listening in to this presentation, uh, please contact me. We, we're really very interested in getting a, a license to run that compiler. And finally, uh, one final note is that Wombat is in fact an open system. If you're at all interested in trying out your favorite codes on the ARC64 platform, uh, please do apply for an account. Just uh, take a look at the uh, web page listed at the bottom of the screen here and, uh, uh, and, and apply. It's actually very simple to get on and we're happy to uh, let others use the system. So uh, thank you very much for uh, listening and I hope everybody has a good day.